take 58 and action 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 <sighs> put sprocket in the videos they said it'll be adorable they said the internet loves cats they said <sighs> hello internet my name is quinn and this is blondie axe well, it's the second major milestone on the Pennsylvania A3 switcher build. The first milestone was the boiler completion, and today I'm going to finish the tender chassis. And it's going to include a very cool finishing technique that I'm really excited about because painting is for chumps. So let's go. I'm going to start by gathering my materials for the first of the components, which are the step ladders. These are made from some brass of different thicknesses, and I need some slitting saws of specific thicknesses for cutting slots. These pieces are fabricated roughly from kind of a tab and slot design, and then they're milled and filed to final shape, as you'll see. It's a pretty interesting process. It's a way to make complex pieces from bar stock without needing castings. I laid out all the little pieces I'll need, and I'm going to cut those to rough shape on the bandsaw. There's two of these step ladders, one on each front corner of the tender. They would be used by the fireman to get on and off of the tender as needed and I'm going to be making both of these at once. We don't need a lot of accuracy here because these parts are basically made from the inside out. Everything is made to shape very roughly, and then all of the outside material is all going to be filed and sanded away, as you'll see. I started by gang milling all of the pieces together to create one reference surface on all of them, and then I went back in and milled each piece to the dimension it needs to be one at a time. I do figure out a quicker way to do this in a moment, but for now, this is how I did it. The tricky part of these pieces is once they are squared up and brought to dimension, there needs to be slits cut on the sides, the long sides of each one. And being that this is a milling machine and a slitting saw, the pieces have to be positioned vertically in order to do this. I made a couple of attempts to square up all the pieces all at once on the side of the vise like this, but this was just a mess. This was never going to work very well, so I needed a better approach. This is where I finally figured out it's a lot quicker for milling and slitting to glue all the pieces together into a stack. Some very thin CA glue and some clamping for 10 minutes or so to make sure you get maximum strength out of that glue is enough to hold all these pieces together through multiple operations. Once I figured this out, I started doing all subsequent pieces like this. This works great for milling two dimension as well. When glued together as a piece, now it's quite straightforward to get the whole blob of them oriented vertically. I also switched to using my small toolmaker's vise, which is a lot easier on small parts like this. And I'm also blocking up the far side of the jaw with a stack of scrap, the same thickness to balance the clamping force. That ensures a good grip on the pieces that you're cutting. Double check that everything is square and we're ready to go. I also need to double check that I have enough of the material sticking out the edge of the vise for the depth of the slots that are being cut. These slots are quite deep. They're actually fully halfway through the parts, and that means I need more than half of the material sticking out of the edge of the vise. So there's not a lot of material being clamped on. That's why I have to take special care to balance the vise jaw and make sure I've got a good grip, and gluing the pieces together also helps with that. And now I can get the saw in position, and away we go. Remember that I said these pieces are essentially being made from the inside out. I've scribed a center line approximately on the center of one of the pieces, and approximately is enough. All of these pieces are quite a bit over length. The outside edge of each of these slits essentially marks the edge of the part, as you'll see. So anything past the edge of that slot is all going to get cut away later anyway. All that matters is that the slots are the right distance apart, and that they're all within the material here. So centering them roughly equidistant from a center line that I've scribed on the part is sufficient. All that matters is that we get the dimensions of the part within the rough cut area that we have. I got a little close at the bottom there. Apparently I'm not very good at measuring center of things, but I got away with it. Next, the heat wrench takes care of separating the parts. The heat breaks up that glue, no trouble, and does leave a little bit of residue on there, which acetone will remove if you need to. Some of the pieces were longer, however, and there wasn't clearance around the top of the mill spindle, so I had to do those in two passes. I had to flip them end for end after doing the first cut. To make sure I got them aligned, I ended up using one slot as the reference for the other slot and measuring the distance between them with the Z-axis on the DRO. 
Unfortunately, it didn't all go to plan. I mismeasured the length of these three pieces, these longer pieces, and well, the slots ended up too close to one end and ended up breaking off the end of the material. I did do a decent job of measuring center on those ones this time, but the pieces were actually too short because I had misread the drawing on how long they should be. So I got to make those pieces again, but not a huge deal. Especially since I figured out to super glue them together right away and then do all of the milling and various other operations with them glued together. Boy, does that speed things up. Here are all the pieces for a single step ladder then. Remember, there's two of all of these. And you can see how they fit together with a tab and a slot kind of construction. This is all straight from the book. This isn't stuff that I'm making up. You're seeing one of Kozo's many clever techniques that he uses to build his locomotives entirely out of bar stock and not require any castings. So that's the top of the step ladder. The legs will be splayed out later to fit the wider pieces at the bottom. But at this stage, I'm ready to silver solder together what we have. And again, everything is overly long and off-center and so on, but none of that matters. As you'll see, that's all going to get machined away. So those pieces get fluxed together with the tabs and slots. It's cool, the pieces are kind of self-supporting in these structures, so you don't need any fixturing screws or anything. Just a little teeny piece of solder on each of those joints, and I can solder all four of those joints in one go. Silver soldering these tiny assemblies is really quite fun, because I can use a small torch, as you see, and it goes very, very quickly, because there's not a lot of material to heat up. I showed you this entire operation without any cuts, because that's how quickly it goes. After pickling, here are the two ladder assemblies. I got one corner of one joint where the solder didn't flow there, but otherwise everything went fine. I reflowed that solder later, and it was all good. The next job, then, is to splay out the legs to fit the wide base. This doesn't have to hit any specific dimension. The main goal is just to make them both look the same. And, you know, this is just a best effort sort of situation. The ladders are on opposite sides of the tender, so you can't see both of them at once, so yeah, as long as they're close, no one will know the difference. I'm really enjoying this kind of tab and slot style of fabrication. This is not something I had done before with small brass model parts, but it's really satisfying. It's a lot of work to do all this assembly, and you have to have a bunch of slitting saws of the exact right widths, but it works really well. Next, each of these pieces gets a backing plate on it. Again, this is just rough cut, and it's all going to be machined down to final shape later. These assemblies are all silver soldered together, but the backs of them may not be totally flat because of the you know, variations in silver soldering and so on that can occur. So these are flattened on the belt sander, which is a new addition to my shop. A generous viewer took pity on my lack of having a belt sander and sent that to me, so thank you very much. Now with that assembly flattened on the back, it'll sit nicely on the backing plates and I can flux everything up and solder it together. The soldering method that I'm using for this step is the one that's suggested in the book by Kozo, but honestly, I kind of felt like it wasn't a great setup and uh, it turns out I was right. I might know enough about silver soldering to be dangerous. What's happening here is I'm heating the upper pieces, but the base plate being away from the torch on the far side and the solder sitting on top the base plate is not getting enough heat, and also probably the fire brick is absorbing a lot of the heat, so the solder flowed up the legs of the sides of the piece. It didn't actually flow onto the plate below the base plate. So those joints are no good. And in fact, a light tap with a hammer broke that free. There was very little bond there. So I cleaned everything up and did it again with this setup instead. Solder is still in the same places, everything's the same, except I'm heating the base plate from below, and the base plate has all the mass, and I'm heating the far sides of the joints, which is always what you want to do whenever possible in silver soldering. As you can see, that is working beautifully. A little wash of heat from above as well, just to make sure everything got evenly heated, but you can already see those are much, much better joints. When you get all the variables right, silver soldering is very satisfying and honestly kind of magical. The solder just goes exactly everywhere that you want it to. A trip through the pickle bath for both of those, and here are the assemblies. Nicely soldered, as you can see. I've got a really nice solder fillet all the way around every single joint. That is looking pretty decent. But now it's time to carve, if you will, the step ladders out of this kind of rough assembly of parts that we have. So I'm going to start by cutting off most of the excess over on the bandsaw, being careful not to get too close to the sides, and I want to cut into my side pieces. Then to file those rough edges of the saw cuts down to meet up with the sides, some quality time on the die filer was in order. You could certainly do this by hand as well, but uh, the die filer with a, an assortment of different shapes of files on it, some flat, some triangular, some round, was really a nice way to do that. That went really well. 
The outer perimeters of the step ladders are done. Now it's just a case of finishing up the faces of them. The faces of them have kind of a complicated carved shape to them. I did some very sloppy layout work on the sides of the pieces to kind of roughly lay out the shape that I wanted. This doesn't have to be perfect, of course. These are entirely aesthetic details. The main goal is, once again, just to get the two step ladders to look basically the same and uh, to look aesthetically pleasing and more or less like the drawings that Kozo has in the book. Many of these shapes don't even actually have dimensions on them, so you're really on your own to just make something that looks nice. A combination of fret saw and hand filing work seemed to be the easiest way to do this. So the top of the steps is thinned out, and then there's kind of a swoopy curve shape that connects to the wider base. Once again, I did my best to make them both look the same. I think I did fairly decent at that. I don't know. I guess you'll be the judge, as YouTube commenters always are, but I am reasonably pleased with those. And once again, you'll never be able to see them both at the same time anyway once mounted. Speaking of which, they get a couple of holes drilled in them for mounting. These holes need to be countersunk, but the countersink tool that you saw me grind in a recent video does not fit into this tiny little space. So I had to grind a new one that's smaller. This one I ground on the D-Bit grinder once again, but this time from an old center drill that I found in the drawer. That worked just fine. I always keep old tools around because high-speed steel is very useful for making your own cutters on short notice. This one is not as pretty, and unfortunately that center drill seems to be a little bent, but uh, it still worked just fine. I find countersunk bolt heads extremely satisfying. When you get that depth just right and the bolt is flush, oh, I love that. Next up are a couple of little L brackets to mount those to the tender frame. For these, I decided to use the what I call CNC fabrication method, so named because it's often how CNC machines are set up to build things. Basically, you take stock that's overly thick for what you need, and you set it up like this, just a little bit stuck down in the vise with enough sticking up to machine your entire part. And if you plan your order of operations carefully, you can frequently mill an entire part in a single setup by using this approach. On small milling machines, this really only works well in brass because it does involve a lot of heavy cutting that if you were trying to do this in steel on a small milling machine would be a lot of extra work. You're better off starting with a piece that's closer to the final shape that you need in that case. The various mounting holes and so on all get drilled as well. Again, there's two of these L brackets, so I'm being careful to center the bracket on each end of the piece because the ends of the pieces are still rough cut. So the references are the center holes, and I'm being careful to leave enough excess material at the ends and between the pieces so that I can mill those ends square and to dimension after cutting them apart. I hope that made sense. Anyway, after all the features that we can do in that setup, then I put it in upside down and I mill away the excess material on the bottom. Those were cut apart on the bandsaw, and now I need to mill the ends square and two dimension. Once again, the holes are my reference here, so I put them in the vise like so. I lined up the drill on one of the holes to get my distance to mill the side clean and two dimension, and then I did the same thing with the other piece on the other end of the vise. That allows me to do both pieces at the same time, and the pieces are balancing the vice jaws for me. Then I had to flip them around and do the same thing on the other ends, of course. So here is one of the two little brackets after all of the features have been added. And they sit right on the frame, as you can see there. And the ladders will be screwed onto those. That is looking pretty good. Of course, I had to make custom length screws for everything, as is always the case on these model parts. You buy the screws overly long, and you cut them down to length. And that's looking very nice indeed. Very pleased with how all that has come together. These ladders are quite an attractive feature, I think. At the other end of the tender, we have what's called the coupler pocket. This holds the coupler that pulls all of the cars behind the locomotive. This is assembled in very much the same way, so I'm skipping over most of the steps. But you can see it's made from much thicker material, and it has fixturing screws that go through the major pieces. This is because, you know, holding the coupler, it's pulling, well, you, and has to be quite strong. And what a lot of people don't know about silver solder is that it's very strong in shear, but not strong in tension. And some of these crucial joints on this coupler pocket are in tension, so the screws are important for additional strength. Now, brass is plenty strong for this. It doesn't have to be steel, but you do have to be careful and have good silver solder technique on a piece like this. So once again, with that assembly silver soldered together, much like the ladders, this is where we're at. Now we can start milling and filing the final piece out of this. 
We got silver solder through the screws as well, so everything's going to be very, very strong here. Here's what the pocket looks like with the outer dimensions all milled to dimension. It's looking pretty decent, looking coupler pockety, but we've still got a bunch of face details to do. However, before I can do that, I need to finish the mounting system. The coupler pocket is screwed on to two different sides of the frame for extra strength, but this top piece that screws onto the top, I didn't want to risk relying on my accurate silver soldering to get that in the right place. So I decided to transfer the position of this from the other assembly once it had been completed. So mounting holes were drilled for that. Again, fixturing screws because there are some silver solder joints in tension there to add extra strength. And I'll do one more test fit after that assembly is done to make sure it's going to fit before I silver solder things together. And that is looking really good. So I think we're ready to silver solder that tab in place. That's going to be very, very strong. So after silver soldering, then I drilled the top mounting holes. Now I can do one more test fit to make sure that everything's going to fit together. It almost does. The silver solder added a bit of a fillet on that inside corner, as you might expect, and that is keeping the pocket from seating nicely against the frame rail. So a little bit of work with a file to sharpen up that inside corner, and now that's seating very, very nicely. The final step then for mounting is to transfer punch those top mounting holes into the frame. Those mounting holes are in the drawings, of course, but again, I didn't want to rely on my silver soldered assemblies all landing in exactly the right places. Now the face of the coupler pocket gets a bunch of cosmetic details. So I start by milling the outer face down to dimension, then there are some angled cuts on the sides that look nice. These are just done by layout and milling down to a layout line. This is all aesthetic, so nothing super accurate required here. Then the legs that form the lower support of the coupler pocket get an angle on them as well. I found it easiest to do this with a fret saw and some filing. The more details that we add to this coupler pocket, the more difficult it gets to hold on to. So I kind of had to do less milling and more sawing and filing as we went along. The entire face of the coupler pocket gets a nice gentle radius on it, but that radius is centered on a position in space behind the part. That's always fun. So I've got a piece of scrap clamped into space behind the part, and I marked the center of the radius on that, and then I was able to use that to support the dividers to scribe that line. And now I can file down to that curve. As you can clearly see through my transparent hands, I rough that in on the belt sander first. That's turning out to be an excellent addition to the shop. And then I finish that up with some filing. This is the final coupler pocket. It's looking pretty snazzy, I think. This is, again, Kozo's design, so all credit to him for that. I'm just following his instructions to make this. But it is quite a nice replica of the 1911 Pennsylvania A3 switcher coupler pocket. At the other end of the tender, the front, there is a drawbar that attaches it to the locomotive. This is held in place by a drawbar pocket, which is this piece here. I made this off camera because as you can see, it's very trivial. It's just some basic milling and drilling operations, nothing too exciting there. The hole that holds the drawbar goes all the way through this pocket and the frame for strength. So I just used a drill to hold the two pieces in position while I screw them together. These pieces are never going to come apart again after this. More details at the back of the locomotive. There's a piece called the footboard, which is kind of like a rear bumper. It's a small L-shaped piece that's held in place with some long L-shaped legs that you see me making here. Again, I'm skipping over this. Nothing too exciting here. Just a lot of milling pieces to dimension and bending them on the brake, as you've seen me do lots and lots already on this project. What is new and exciting is my finishing. As you can see, I've switched from paint to powder coat for all of these locomotive pieces. I did an entire video devoted to this new home powder coating setup that I've experimented with, and I gotta say it's working super, super well. Unlike paint, it has no trouble sticking to this brass, and the final coat is extremely durable. I'm really very excited about this. I wish I had tried powder coating years before. The finish is great. It does not hide any crimes, so any imperfections you see there are my workmanship, not the paint. But the final coating is just crazy durable. Like, it's very impressively durable. So go watch my video on powder coating for all the details there. For the frame, I wanted to powder coat as much of it as one assembly as possible to avoid a lot of tricky masking and fitting. So it was too awkward to hang it from wires like you normally try to do with powder coating. Hey, Editor Quinn breaking in here. Something that might have worked better here is to stand the toaster oven on edge 
and that would allow me to hang the entire frame from wires probably fairly easily, which would have been more effective than what I did here. That's a really great idea that was given to me by some patrons and also by a bunch of viewers in comments on my powder coating video. Awesome idea. Unfortunately, the work here was done before the powder coating video was released, so I hadn't yet seen all those awesome suggestions. So I'll definitely be trying that in the future. So I opted to do it as one assembly minus the bolsters, because that was what would fit comfortably in the oven. The whole thing would technically fit in the oven, but it would be difficult to get it in there without bumping the powder coat, and that's obviously going to ruin the coating. So I did it in two steps, supporting the piece on some silicone cones, as you see, and I did one side and then flipped it over and did a second coat to get the other side. This seemed to work well, although fair warning, try not to do two coats of powder coat if you can help it. The second coat never goes as well as the first one does, so if you can do pieces in one pass, it's definitely better. But this certainly came out good enough for the frame. I masked off the ends of the frame with some captain tape to keep the powder coat from interfering with the fit up. This was an easy compromise between trying to do the whole frame at once and trying to do every single individual piece at once, which would have involved a lot of masking. I covered this tray with aluminum foil to keep it from getting powder coated, but the aluminum got quite a nice powder coat just from overspray from the powder falling on it in the booth. This aluminum foil was not even grounded, and as you can see, it got a very thorough powder coating. You can see how durable that coating is. I'd like to see paint stand up to that on aluminum foil. The end bolsters were then done separately as whole parts. I was able to hang them on wires and I masked off the mating areas once again. My mating areas are not perfect, but they won't be visible once the tender is assembled anyway, so if there's a little bit of brass showing, that's okay. On pieces like these, a screw threaded into one of the holes makes an excellent ground post for the powder coater. I then had to, of course, run a tap through all those threaded holes to clean the powder coat out of them, but that's not a big deal. Now time for reassembly. My general philosophy on powder coating assemblies was to powder coat things that are never going to have to come apart. If something will have to be removed from something else someday potentially, then I would powder coat it separately. So the steps and footboards and this coupler pocket and so on were all powder coated separately, but the entire frame was powder coated together because it never needs to come apart again. Or at least the entire frame within the limits of what would again comfortably fit in my oven. I'm using bolts for the coupler pocket because they will be visible and bolts look better, but screws everywhere else because screws are a whole lot easier at this size. You'll note that these fasteners are all still brass. Uh, they're going to be blackened. I decided to try brass blackener on them, which will be easier than paint for these tiny fasteners, but I wasn't able to get it shipped in time to finish this video. Here I'm installing the footboard, which you didn't see me make. I kind of glossed over it because it's not very exciting. You saw the interesting parts of it. Powder coat is a little thin on the bottom, but I decided not to try and fix that because it won't be visible. And I learned from doing the frame that a second coat of powder coat is kind of a tricky business that has a good chance of screwing up the whole coating. So I opted to leave it since it's not visible. Well, there we go. There is the completed powder coated tender frame. I am really quite pleased with that. However, what I think is irrelevant, this being a milestone, it's time for QC inspection. Longtime viewers will remember that the boiler achieved the highest cat rating, which was general disdain. Let's see how this one does. Now I've just woken her up from her 17th nap, which is the most important one of the day, so she may need a little bit of encouragement to get to work here. Okay, good. Starting our walk around. Eh, her heart's not really in this inspection. Eh. Uh, well, you know, I thought general disdain was the highest rating, but in fact... The tender chassis has earned total disregard, an even better rating. Well, that is the true test of quality. I'm very excited about that. I hope you've enjoyed this process. Next big milestone on this locomotive is going to be the tender tank, the water tank, and the coal bunker that's set on top of this frame. I'm looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Thanks for your support. Thanks especially to my awesome patrons who've made all of this content possible. And I will see you next time.